This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. This video goes through question one from the June 2010 Business Analysis P3 paper. So here you are in the exam, and in your first 50 minutes, you are allowed to open the question paper, begin to read, and to make notes on the question paper. So what do you see? You see question one. And question one is potentially a little intimidating. So here is its uh, first page, second page, third page, a diagram, and then the requirements. It can be very difficult to avoid a feeling of panic. But what you should do is go to the first requirement, Part A, and see what it asks. Part A nearly always asks you to analyse the position of the organisation or, or some minor variant of that. And armed with that, what you should then do is to go through the question, uh, carefully noting what is there that may be relevant to that appraisal. So let's look at Part A in just a, a little bit more detail, just to see what the requirements are. So here's a Part A requirement. The new CEO, Sheila Jenkins, recognises that she should understand the strategic position of WET before considering strategic options and changes. She wants a concise assessment of the strategic position covering environment, strategic capability, stakeholder expectations and organisational mission. There's a lot there, which is good news. Uh, the more that's asked, uh, the easier it should be to produce a good answer. Let's just think ahead a little bit. Whenever it says environment, you should be thinking of pastel and very often five forces. Five forces really look at the competitive environment. When you look at strategic capability, you should be thinking of resources and competences. These can be regarded as the strengths plus perhaps the weaknesses of the organisation and to a large extent Pestel and the Five Forces will look at the opportunities plus the threats facing the organisation. Stakeholder expectations, well about the only piece of theory one comes across or one only model one comes across dealing with stakeholders is, is looking at Mendeleev. Whether we'll be able to use that or not, uh, we uh, have to see, but we should be keeping it in mind. And finally, the organisational mission. There's no particular model dealing with organisational mission, but we must make sure we make some reference to mission when we're writing our answer. Note uh, here, uh, there will be some four professional marks uh, awarded for the scope, structure and tone of the answer. This is the use of language, professional language, for example, uh, using appropriate terminology, setting it out in paragraphs, organising your thoughts uh, in a logical fashion. So, bear in mind, when we go through this, we'll be looking at pastel. We'll be looking for anything to do with five forces. We'll be looking at resources and competences, anything to do with uh, stakeholder expectations. And if we can assign some of the Mendel of names, great and also the organisational mission. Now what we're going to do is to go back and read carefully through the question. And as we go through, we will make notes on the question, which will be useful to us when we come to be able to write the answer to this part. OK, let's read through the question, focusing on the requirements of Part A, which was basically uh, pastel, resources, competence, mission, and the stakeholder requirements. Arcadia is a country of great mineral wealth and a hard-working, well-educated population. So there may be something here relevant to economics. 
and maybe something relevant here to social. It has recently enjoyed sustained economic growth generated from the expansion of its manufacturing industry. So it looks as though perhaps at this stage anyway the, econo the economy is quite good. The population has grown well. As a result, agricultural output has increased to satisfy the population with much previously marginal land converted to arable and pasture land. However, after 10 years of sustained economic growth, the country in 2009 began to experience economic problems. Gross domestic product has declined for three successive quarters and there is increasing unemployment. Surveys have shown that wages are stagnant and retail sales are falling. There are also increasing problems with servicing both personal and business debt leading to personal bankruptcy and homelessness. Well, our original thought of the economy being good has been turned on its head. There's a lot here saying that the economy is having considerable problems and, and, and again there are considerable social problems which seem to be uh, arising. The climate of the country is also changing, becoming drier and windier. So what we have there is ecological the second E in the uh, the pastel, and for the first time last year, the government had to ration water to domestic homes. The formation of wet. In 2002, the environmental campaigner Zohail Abbas published a book on the wetlands of Arcadia. The wetlands of Arcadia are areas of natural habitat made up of land that is saturated with moisture, such as swamp, marsh, or bog. His book chronicled the systematic destruction of the wetlands due to population growth. So I suppose there is more e ecological uh, sort of factors there. Increased economic development and climate change. Water had been progressively drained from wetlands to provide land for farming and to provide water for the increased uh, population and industry. Wetlands also provided an important habitat for well for wildlife. Dr. Abbas showed that in the period 70 to 2000, there had been a dramatic decline in birds, mammals and fish dependent upon the wetland habitat. Some species have become extinct. So very much a, a paragraph dealing with ecological occurrences. Moving on down. In 2003, Dr. Abbas formed the Wetland Trust WET with the aim of preserving, restoring and managing wetlands. So the aim is, is really looking at the, the mission. The mission of this organization is preserving, restoring and managing wetlands in Arcadia. Since its formation, the, the Trust has acquired the four remaining wetlands sites left in the country. So those are very much resources. We have all the wetlands, it would seem to be there. The Trust work is funded through donations and membership fees. Donations are one-off contribution. Membership is through an annual subscription which gives members the right to visit wetlands. So this is uh, giving us some indication, perhaps, of um, uh, some of our stakeholders. We might also be able to foresee uh, that the donations and indeed the membership might possibly have gone down. Uh, we're facing hard economic times and it's in these sort of times that uh, voluntary contributions and voluntary memberships are often hit first. Each wetland site is managed by volunteers who provide access and guidance to members. So, managed by volunteers, I suppose this is a, a form of resource that we have. The wetlands are not currently open to the general public. Now that's quite interesting, I'm not quite sure where that comes, but the general public is a potential uh, uh, stakeholder. Presumably, the, the members and indeed the people who are volunteering are also stakeholders.
Dr. Abbas's work at, uh, on the wetlands has brought him to the attention of the Arcadian public and he's now a popular presenter, so very much a, a good resource of the organization. And WET is a strong brand, again, very much a, a resource of the organization with an 85% recognition level. WET is a registered charity. Charities in Arcadia have to be registered with the Commission of Charities, which regulates charities within the country. The number of charities has increased significantly, so I suppose there there's an element of competition. We can really see the organisation, it's, it's, it's an environment where there's hard economic times uh, and also the number of charities has increased, the competition for, for, for people's charitable donations has, in, has increased. The number of charities has increased significantly in the last few years, leading to widespread criticism from established charities, politicians and the public, who believe that many of these charities uh, have been formed to exploit tax advantages. Dr. Abbas is a vociferous critic, as you might expect, particularly after the Commission gave permission uh, to the, for the establishment of a rival wetland charity. So there we have a bit of competition direct competition uh, maybe to what wetlands is doing uh, despite the fact that all wetlands in arcadia are under wet's control wwtft promised to create new wetlands artificially uh, and they have so far raised only 90,000 out of 151 million, million needed so although there, there is competition it would seem to me that that competition isn't going to be very strong especially if they need 151 million to set up a swamp Dr. Abbas was part of a group that lobbied the government for the reform of the Commission of Charities, but the government has rejected their advice. So there may be a political thing here. Uh, the government may be slightly uh, averse to, to what the organisation is doing or to, to what charities are doing. And in fact, we then read later on that the government of Arcadia has recently changed the rules on charity taxation. Previously, once the charity's accounts had been audited, the government paid the charity a sum of 20% of the total value of donations and membership fees. This reflected the income tax the donor would have paid on the amount had they given it to charity. However, the government has now declared that this is unfair as not all donations or membership fees are from Arcadian taxpayers or from people in Arcadia who actually pay tax. Subsequently, in the future, charities will have to prove that a donation or membership fee for us from an Arcadian taxpayer. Only donations of fees supported by this proof will receive the 20% or so gift help refund. Research and evidence from other countries suggests that 30% of donors will not uh, give the gift aid details required and so the charity will not be able to claim tax from these donors. So we're very much poor economic prospect there not only is the economy in hard times, the tax rules have changed. Whether you call it e economics or politics doesn't much matter, but, the, but they're, they're almost certainly going to be facing a decrease in their income. Maybe we can work out what that is, uh, because it says an analysis of WET's income for 2008 is given in Figure 1, uh, and an analysis of all charities in Figure 2. Research has also shown that 55% of members and 85% of donors gives money to other charities. So now we have to think, why have we been told that? And I suppose it might be competition. These people are obviously aware that there are other charities around and we're com co really competing now uh, for a slice of a smaller cake. On to the second page. And here we have figure one and figure two. You should always try and make use of any quantitative data given to you in the question. Uh, and here we have quantitative data dealing basically with their income. So adding these across, we've got 750,000 there. We have 150,000 there. And we have 100,000 there. So this is going to add up, obviously, to the 1 million. How is this going to be uh, affected by the tax changes? Well, for people who are taxpayers, it was suggested that 30% would not give us 
the information we needed to get the tax refund. And that means we're going to be losing out 20% uh, of that income. So there we have uh, a fifth of 750, that will be 150, 30% uh, of 150, that's going to be 45 loss. Arcadian non-taxpayers, 150, uh, and if you don't pay tax, you won't get the refund, so there's another 20% gone there, so that's going to be uh, 30 gone. Yeah. And finally, non-Arcadian people, uh, 100,000, they will not generate any sort of tax refund either, so there's another 20 gone. So it's roughly minus 10%. Income, just because of the tax change, even before we deal with hard economic uh, times, is going to fall by 10%. Why have we been given this information? Well, uh, I think we've maybe been given this information because we're told there are charities here which are maybe particularly attractive to people. Uh, people are maybe rank charities in terms of where they think the money is better deserved. And it could well be the case that people are particularly attracted uh, maybe to health charities, social care charities, and maybe international charities uh, where you're, you're, you're helping to relieve suffering abroad. If you haven't got as much income coming in, if interest rates have gone up, uh, if you're in uh, fear of losing your job, perhaps, then you may be thinking of cutting back charitable uh, donations. And the chances are, maybe, that you will maintain the ones you think are more important and you will attack the ones which you think are slightly more discretionary. Very much economic stuff. And there's some comp competitive stuff in there as well. What was originally a vehicle for promoting the vision and ideology of Dr. Abbas, volunteers were recruited to manage and administer the wetland sites, and the number of members gradually increased. See figure three, we'll see it in a moment. Many of these volunteers have become acknowledged experts in wetlands. So if you're an expert, I think you're probably a, a resource or, or you're displaying some sort of competence uh, there. Uh, and their knowledge and experience is valued by members. Remember, these people are volunteers who have become experts and the members, they're also stakeholders. Administrative costs uh, rose at a faster rate than subscriptions and donations. Administrative staff are full-time paid employees of the charity. However, despite an increase in staff numbers, there is a substantial backlog in cleared applications in the membership department, which have not yet been entered into the membership computer system. So there we have a, a, a pretty much a weakness. Uh, it, it's the absence of a, a, a competence, the absence of a resource. The membership computer system is one of the systems used to support administration. However, the functionality of this software is relatively restricted and cumbersome. So again, this cumbersome software is very much a weakness and have been complaints about its accuracy another weakness. For example, members claim that renewal reminders are often sent out to people who have already paid and that members who should have received renewal notices never received them. As a result, we seem to be wasting money and losing members. Uh, pretty much a weakness in the admin system. Members have become increasingly frustrated by their limited access to wetlands and many wish to participate more in determining the policies of the organisation. So these people are pretty important stakeholders. If we look back up at where the income comes from, up here, you see the, the bulk of income does come from members. Donors are important, but, but we, we are really seem to be annoying members uh, there. They wish to participate more in determining the policy of the organisation. They feel that wetland sites should have better facilities, so again, perhaps uh, better resources are needed, such as toilets and concealed positions for bird for bird watching. Increasing criticisms of Dr Abbas's domineering style and cavalier 
disregard for his members. So he, I think, probably very much regards himself as the key player. And to some extent, the, the members, if we're thinking of uh, in terms of Mendeleev's matrix here, uh, the members, uh, perhaps, are, are more the keep satisfied people. Membership is currently falling and very little money spent on sales and marketing to arrest this fall. So again, a potential weakness in marketing. Volunteers, that's as well as members, have also become disgruntled with Dr. Abbas's management style. They feel patronized and undervalued. So again, these are, are, are very much either keep satisfied or keep informed, or maybe even, goodness knows, uh, uh, minimal uh, involvement there. The number of volunteers is declining, which was reducing access to members, because of course these volunteers uh, had become uh, very important resources. Uh, and a recent decision not to pay travelling expenses to volunteers led to further resignations. How very odd. Here we have volunteers who are experts, who we know are valuable resources, and now we're really irritating them by not paying travelling expenses. They're going to be really alienated. If we look at the figures uh, along here, we see that the organization peaked in 2007 uh, and now has had two periods of, of, of declining numbers. At the 2009 AGM, Dr. Abbas Studan announced the appointment of a new chief executive officer. He admitted in an emotional resignation speech that he had not sufficiently taken into account the views of members, donors and volunteers. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the, the, the stakeholders, the other stakeholders. It is a matter of deep regret that I spent more time focusing on wetlands than uh, on people. He was made an honorary president in recognition of his work in establishing and expanding the charity. The new CEO wishes to pursue a more inclusive strategy and immediately set out set about counselling and membership and the voluntary staff to see what they wanted. The two clearest messages were, first of all, they wanted better access to wetlands and they're more interested in the wildlife rather than the, 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 the wetlands. So this is maybe saying that our mission should be changed. Dr. Abbas's original mission was to preserve the wetlands. Now people seem to be more interested in preserving the, the animals, I suppose, plus the wetlands as an environment for them to live in. And this, uh, oh yes, this uh, was not a view shared by Dr. Abbas, who wanted the wetlands preserved for their own sake. Volunteers wished to be much more involved in the running of the organization and wanted to be treated in a way uh, that recognized their voluntary commitment. So again, we have these volunteers who, who want, in, in a way, to be more, I suppose, to become kind of key, key players, to be more actively involved. Now, I know, because of reading this question before, that for part A, you don't really need to read much more than that. Doing the question and exam, you'd read all the way through just to make sure there was nothing tucked away down below. But we have a huge amount of uh, information uh, here dealing with the strategic analysis here. We have stuff on economics, we have uh, social stuff, a well-educated population, therefore, interested in wetlands. However, uh, there's a lot of unemployment and homelessness and economic hardship. Uh, we have information about the uh, ecological uh, effects uh, going on there. We have mission, we have stakeholders, uh, we have lots of resources, political stuff, and we have also been able to do some calculations as to how the income of the organization is going to be adversely affected. If I were writing this out, uh, I would think about uh, looking at the environment, then looking at resources, then looking at stakeholders, then looking at mission. Part B of the question. 15 marks. We're asked to analyse the faults in the current membership renewal process that caused the problems identified above and to suggest solutions that would remedy these faults. So make sure we get everything. We have to analyse the faults 
we have to suggest solutions that would remedy those faults and we have to address the three problems which have been identified above the low response to payment requests the dispatch of renewal reminders for people who have already paid and the failure to send renewal invoices to some members so here are details of the membership renewal process from the question and I have uh, put at the top uh, the three problems which were identified in the question just so we can keep those in mind. We have to identify the source of the problems and we have to suggest uh, ways in which that could, those problems could be remedied. So let's read through it. One month before the date of membership renewal, the computer system, the membership system, sends a renewal invoice to a current but not lapsed member giving subscription details and asking for payment. That seems okay. A copy of this invoice is sent to the membership department who file it away. Approximately 80% of members decide to renew and send their payment, either credit cards or check. The membership department matches the payment to the renewal invoice copy. The invoice copy, stamp paid, is sent to the sales and marketing department who use it to produce a membership card and send this card together with a guide to sites booklet to the member. The membership department passes payment to the finance department. So already we have at least three departments involved, perhaps another one if there's a separate department looking after the computer system. This is surely something which could really be handled by maybe only one department. It's essentially a kind of receivables ledger. You send the invoice out and you wait for the money to be coming in. There's certainly, I think, not the need for three departments here, perhaps only two. Finance now submits payments to the bank. In other words, after the membership card has been sent to the member. It currently takes the finance department an average of five days from the receipt of the renewal to notifying the membership department of the cleared payment. Once cleared, finance notifies membership department by email and they update the membership system to record that the, the, the payment has been made. As mentioned before, there is a backlog in entering these details into the computer system. So we see, seem to have two delays here. There is a five day delay before discovering uh, whether or not the person has actually paid. And there seems to be another delay here in updating the system once we know the person has paid. No wonder that certain things are going wrong. Uh, and I'm thinking of the middle one here, dispatch of renewal reminders to people who have already paid. Uh, they have paid, but the, the delays are so great that we think they haven't paid and, and so we go through some process again. Some checks do not clear, often because they are filled in incorrectly. In other words, nothing wrong with the member. The member thinks they've paid, but we don't match it to the right member or something of that sort. In these circumstances, finance raises a payment request and sends it to the member. Now, a payment request is, is the third thing which is mentioned up here. And this is what sparks them off. It's when we think they haven't paid uh, or the check doesn't clear or it's not properly matched. Credit card payments are cleared instantly. But again, there may be problems with the details. For example, incorrect numbers and incorrect expiry dates lead to transaction not being authorised. And again, there's a payment request. So these payment requests seem to be being raised where people appear not to have paid. But of course, they may have paid. The credit card payments are cleared instantly, but we're maybe not matching it against the right debtor, if you like, the, the right receivable balance. Members' response to payment requests is very low, in other words, about 5%, and this is obviously irritating the finance manager. But it, it could well be that members' response to these payment requests is low because a member feels, I have already paid, uh, that, that it's uh, not my mistake, perhaps it's left their bank account and been matched incorrectly. Also not shown on the diagram, one week before renewal, the membership system produces a renewal reminder and sends it to the member. So uh, it, this is, I think, something, uh, this, this renewal reminder here is what we're, we're kind of talking about, I think. 
a renewal mind reminder is sent when we think people haven't um, haven't paid, but but in fact they they probably have paid. Some members pay as a result of this rem uh, reminder. If the payment is not received, then the member details are recorded as lapsed. However, this member may well have paid, or think they have paid. They have, of course, uh, got their uh, membership card together with a, a guide to sites booked that is sent out immediately. If I've got that, I think I've paid. And I would simply assume uh, that this renewal reminder has been sent out effectively in error, uh, and I would certainly not think of, of, of paying again. I wouldn't maybe realise that my payment had gone astray. The problem we haven't quite uh, grasped yet is the top one. Renewal invoices are not sent to every member. Uh, that's quite a, a tricky one to define, I think, and I think we have to go right back to the start here. A renewal invoice uh, is sent to a current but not a lapsed member. The other place that lapsed has come up is right at the bottom. I think uh, what might be happening is we have people who have paid, uh, who in a way are recorded as members, or believe they are members rather, but they're not recorded as members, uh, and then the next year an invoice is simply not, not sent to them. And this is going to almost certainly lead to a reduction in the number of members who are actually there. Here's the swim lane diagram of the membership renewal process. And the first thing to notice is that we have four uh, departments involved. That's a member. Four departments involved of WET in a membership renewal process, uh, which seems a lot. Uh, we already identified, and it's actually it's quite confusing to read in the paragraphs what had happened and generally if something is pretty confusing to read then the process is probably over complex. Second thing just by, by looking at this to, to get an idea about is that every time something goes from one department to another whether it's physical goods in the case of for example a factory or whether it's information or whether it's bits of paper uh, two pieces of work are caused. Work is caused by the person sending the information and work is caused for the person who has to receive and process that information. So anywhere where you see there seems to be a lot of backwards and forwards kind of movement of information or transactions or products uh, is causing a lot of unnecessary work uh, and also introduces at each stage the possibility of error and inefficiency. So we really want to be trying to, to simplify that. Looking at some of the <coughs> particular details here, the, 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 the other thing that we should be alert to is processes happening in irrational orders here. And we've already identified this a bit from the narrative because a swim lane diagram is there to, in a way, help you understand the narrative. So we raise the renewal invoice, uh, a copy is filed with the membership department, the member receives the invoice, the member pays, it's matched there, and here is perhaps where something incorrect kind of happens, is that all of this business here of sending out the membership card and the booklet uh, received by the member happens before uh, we're actually sure the payment has, has occurred. There is a, a lot of uh, a delay being introduced in this system as well. Think how much simpler this would probably be if we were to merge, for example, the sales and marketing department and the membership department. Do we really need those two departments with information going backwards and forwards uh, between them? It would also be substantially simplified if all invoicing and all receipts of cash were simply dealt with by the finance department. So the finance department sends out the invoice. The finance department uh, receives the cash, receives the credit card information. The finance department uh, processes all of that before it tells the membership uh, department or the sales and marketing department, whichever way the merger goes, uh, to begin issuing with the membership card and the, the package booklet. 
It's a straightforward sales transaction. Send the invoice. Make sure you get the cash. If you don't get the money, send another invoice. And only when you're sure that all money has been received properly do you send the goods. Uh, effectively, here it's the membership card and the package booklet. Even better, perhaps, do we actually need uh, to raise an invoice? How about what many modern systems do nowadays is you set up a direct debit and the direct debit takes money from your account automatically. So we, uh, you, you may send some sort of notification to the member saying we are going to take this amount out and so on. But uh, you do away with all the kind of matching process. As soon as we get the money coming in, then we can tell people we have received the money, go ahead, they are members now, go ahead and issue the membership cards and the package booklets. So again, it would be greatly simplified. You would have the finance department, and I would think that the finance department uh, would, would effectively have access to the membership system. This is really where the, uh, the sales invoices or the direct debits are going to come from. We will merge the uh, sales and marketing departments and the uh, membership departments into one. We speed up the processing of receipts of any money. And we don't issue any membership cards. We don't issue any package booklets until we're sure we're paid. And we improve the accuracy of matching money received to the member who has sent it in. Sheila Jenkins sees customers as both prospective and existing members, volunteers and donors of WET. She also wishes to gain increased revenue from each member and donor. Evaluate how email and website technology might facilitate the acquisition and retention of WET's customers, uh, and that is prospective and existing members, volunteers and donors, and support WET's aim to increase revenues from members and donors. So it's basically, how do modern businesses use websites and email in the basically marketing activities. Whenever you're considering how a website and email can help in marketing and selling, one of the best tools to look at is the six eyes of e-business. Websites uh, can provide intelligence, interactivity, individualization, integration, independence of geographical position, uh, and can change industry structure although the last one is probably not so relevant here. What we have to do is to use these in this question to help the acquisition and retention of customers and to gain increased revenues from members and donors. And almost certainly you will have experienced yourself the use of websites in these sort of pursuits. So let's uh, think about this. Let's go down this one. In, in terms of the six eyes, let's think about intelligence. Well, uh, what we can do is we can ask people or get people to register as members. Indeed, this could be part of the renewal process. And every time they visit the site, uh, they log on. And from that, uh, we can identify what particular aspects of what they might be interested in. So if somebody is always interested in, for example, bird watching days, uh, then we will know uh, that it might be worthwhile emailing them about prospective uh, bird watching days which are, are coming up. Uh, we can keep intelligence of uh, how often somebody is visiting the site. And perhaps if somebody doesn't visit the site, we can send them an email saying you haven't been with us uh, recently. Uh, here's some of the current activities that you might be interested in. That will uh, uh, help us, I think, uh, certainly to retain customers uh, and should help us, I think, to increase revenues from customers as well by knowing what they're interested in and focusing on what they're interested in should be a way of increasing revenue. Interactivity. Well, 
uh, an example of interactivity is that many sites have forums. You can allow members to uh, effectively talk to each other. Uh, you can allow members indeed to arrange their own uh, social events. And the interactivity between members and the interactivity between the site and its members is extremely uh, important, certainly in retaining people, uh, but also if people really like the site because of its interactivity, they may well be talking to their friends about it and getting them involved. Individualization. Uh, we can send particular offers to people. We can get people to sign up to particular subparts of the site. So if they're particularly interested in, again, for example, bird watching, anything to do with uh, bird watching, uh, we can automatically send emails or information about that. It should be mentioned that somewhere in here, uh, we could mention the way Facebook uh, and other social networks are currently used to make sure that people are kept informed uh, about areas of interest. Integration. Integration, uh, I'm thinking here particularly of integrating the uh, website registration and the renewal process. Or what we can also have, uh, particularly to increase the revenues here, is we can have uh, sales of goods. So perhaps uh, uh, we can have uh, wildlife photographs, we can have uh, other sorts of uh, well, the sort of stuff that you, you see being sold in art galleries and so on. Uh, and people can see these on the website. They can type in their credit card numbers and the like. And the products can be dispatched to them with very little bother. Independence. I think maybe we haven't looked uh, enough yet at the prospective members uh, and how we're get, going to get new donors and, uh, and, and volunteers uh, to, to WET. And independence may be a way of, of, of attacking this, uh, particularly through things like Google. Independence means really independence of geographical position, but it, it also can mean that people find us uh, whenever they type into search engines particular terms. So if somebody were to type into something like Google, natural history, or ecology, or preservation of habitats, uh, or environment, or pollution, then we should be able to engineer that WET, the website of WET, comes close to the top of the list of the Google returns. So really, for 10 marks, there is an awful lot that you could be mentioning. And one of the best ways is, is to think, what has my experience been of websites? How do they market to me? How do they uh, keep me informed? When do they send me emails? Uh, what offers do they make? And, and so on. Uh, and turn your experience around and write about it in the context of WETS activities and WETS customers.